Well, good morning, and uh, thank you, Tom. And I'm, I'm happy to be here because I'm sort of in an anniversary mode as well. Not only the 75th for the great book that we're all here to hear about and study, but also it's the 50th anniversary of my time as a young staffer on Capitol Hill working for a moderate Republican, and I was drinking the Kool-Aid. You know, I thought bipartisanship was great. I, I thought middle of the road was the right answer. Bipart or politics should stop at the waterline and all this. And I was about ready to head for a lifetime as a kind of junior Mitch McConnell, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, as uh, some kind of uh, Republican rhino. But at the last minute, in the nick of time, someone handed me a tract by Mises. I read it. And of course, uh, life has never been the same again. I was saved. <laughs> uh, it was almost like meeting Jesus in the uh, secular world. And then, of course, uh, my speech today is about the same 75th anniversary that I argue started in 1949, the year the book was published. And that is when America finally pivoted from being a peaceful republic for 146 years, whatever it was, to the global empire that it is today. And so what I'd like to do is develop how all that unfolded and uh, relate it uh, to what uh, Mises thought about many of these issues. Now, obviously, in human action, uh, he skewered the error, the error of military uh, Keynesianism, and for good reason, as it was recently manifested in the Biden administration's hideous claim that the 137 billion so far authorized to blow up things in the Ukraine is good because it helps American jobs and economic growth. Well, yes, all those bombs, shells, tanks, and missiles are made here. But that also means that something else, perhaps a tad more beneficial to Main Street families, is not being made here. To quote Mises, quote, all the materials needed for the conduct of war must be provided by restriction of civilian consumption, by using up a part of the capital available, and by working harder. The whole burden of warring falls upon the living generation. He also cogently noted that until the ideology and propaganda of the warfare state is repudiated, no sustainable peace is possible. He said, to, quote, to defeat the aggressors, is not enough to make peace durable. The main thing is to discard the ideology that generates war. It is notable, as I indicated, that these words were published in the English language for the first time in 1947, which was also the year in which the Cold War was congealed, NATO was launched, and Washington was transformed from, a seat, from the seat of a peaceful republic secure behind the great Atlantic and Pacific moats into the war capital of the world, presiding over a global empire that is neither necessary for homeland security nor compatible with long-term capitalist prosperity and constitutional governance. Worse still, it turns out that the process of administering the warfare state and attending to the business of global empire funds and feeds its own perpetuation. That is, the nation's current 1.3 trillion per year warfare state is so larded with fiscal excess and extravagance that literally tens of billions per year spill over the sides, flowing into the K Street lobbies, the PACs, the think tanks, consultancies, NGOs, advertising and grants to the mainstream media, and all manner of other beltway influence uh, peddling operations. So rather than discarding the ideology of war, as Mises recommended, elected politicians become handmaids of the warfare state, using its fiscal resources to justify, market, promote, and propagandize its policies, projects, and worldview. In effect, Washington has morphed into a freak of world history a planetary war capital dominated by a panoptic complex of arms merchants, paladins of foreign intervention and adventure, and warfare state nomenclatura. 
Never before has there been assembled and concentrated in a single state authority a hegemonic force possessing such enormous fiscal resources and military wherewithal. Not surprisingly, the war capital on the Potomac is Orwellian to the core. War is always and everywhere described as the promotion of peace. Its jackboot of global hegemony is gussied up in the beneficent appearing form of alliances and treaties designed to promote a rule, quote, rule, rules-based order and collective security for the alleged benefit of all of mankind, not simply the peace, liberty, and prosperity within America's homeland. Unfortunately, the whole intellectual foundation of this enterprise is false. The planet is not crawling with all powerful would-be aggressors and empire builders who must be stopped cold at their own borders, lest they devour the freedom of their neighbors near and far. Nor is the DNA of nations perennially infected with incipient butchers and tyrants like Hitler and Stalin. They were one-time accidents of history and are fully distingu distinguishable from the standard run of everyday tin pots like Putin today which actually do arise periodically. But the latter mainly disturb the equipoise of their immediate neighbors, not the peace of the planet. So America's homeland security does not depend upon a far-flung array of alliances and treaties and military bases and foreign influence operations. In today's world, there are no Hitler's actual or eight latent to stop. The whole framework of Pax Americana and the Washington-based Promotion and enforcement of a rules-based international order is an epical blunder. In that regard, Thomas Jefferson got it right more than 200 years ago when apparently channeling George Washington, he admonished, quote, peace, commerce, and honest friendship with all nations, entangling alliances with none. The fact is, even today, the United States is essentially invulnerable to conventional military invasion and occupation. On the North American continent, its 28 trillion GDP towers over the combined 3.8 trillion GDP of Mexico and Canada uh, by seven times. On either shore arise the vast Atlantic and Pacific moats, which are even greater barriers to foreign military assault in the 21st century than they so successfully proved to be in the 19th century. That's because today's advanced surveillance technology and anti-ship missiles would consign an enemy armada to Davy Jones's locker nearly as soon as it steamed out of its own territorial waters. The fact is, in an age when the sky is flush with high-tech surveillance assets, a massive conventional armada couldn't possibly be secretly built, tested, and mustered for a surprise attack without being noticed in Washington. There can be no repeat of the Japanese strike force steaming across the Pacific toward Pearl Harbor, sight unseen. America's ostensible enemies, actually, have no offensive or invasionary capacity at all. Russia has only one aircraft carrier, a 1980s-era vessel which has been in dry, dry dock for repairs since 2017, and is equipped with neither a phalanx of escort ships nor a suite of attack and fighter aircraft, and at the moment, not even an active crew. Likewise, China has just three aircraft carriers, two of which are refurbished rust buckets purchased from the remnants of the old Soviet Union, and which carriers do not even have modern catapults for launching their strike aircraft. Indeed, invasion of the American homeland would require a massive conventional armada of land, air, and sea-based forces many, many times larger than the military behemoth that is now funded by Washington's $900 billion defense budget. The logistical infrastructure that would be needed to control the vast Atlantic and Pacific Ocean moats surrounding North America and to sustain an invasion and occupation force on the U.S. mainland is so mind-bogglingly vast as to be scarcely imaginable. In short, none of the non-NATO countries will be steaming their tiny three, two, or one carrier battle groups towards the shores of either California 
or New Jersey anytime soon. An invasionary force that had any chance at all of surviving a U.S. fortress defense of cruise missiles, drones, jet fighters, attack submarines, and electronics warfare would, be, would need to be 100 times larger. Yet there is no GDP in the world, not the $2 trillion for Russia, the $3.5 trillion for India, or the $18 trillion for China, that is even remotely close in size to the 50 to 100 trillion GDP that would be needed to support such an invasionary force without capsizing the home economy. At the same time, the 11 carrier U.S. carrier battle groups, 11 of them, which will cost upwards of 1.2 trillion over the next decade, would have no role in a continental fortress America defense at all. They would be sitting ducks in the blue waters and far less effective than aircraft and missile defenses based in the North American interior. In short, um, these massively expensive forces have no purpose other than global power projection and the conduct of wars of invasion and occupation abroad. That is, they are the military accoutrements of the war capital, not even remotely relevant to a proper Fortress uh, America defense. In today's world, the only theoretical military threat to America's homeland security is the possibility of nuclear blackmail. That is to say, a first strike capacity so overwhelming, lethal, and effective that an enemy could simply call out checkmate and demand Washington surrender. Yet there is no nation on Earth that has anything close to the first strike force that would be needed to totally overwhelm America's triad nuclear deterrent and thereby avoid a retaliatory annihilation of its own country and people if it attempted to strike first. After all, the U.S. has 3,700 active nuclear warheads, of which 17 uh, 1,770 uh, are operational at any point in time. In turn, these are spread under the sea uh, or deep in underground hardened silos and among a bomber fleet of 66 B-2 and B-52s, all beyond the direction or reach of any nuclear power. For instance, the Ohio-class nuclear submarines each have 20 missile tubes with each missile carrying an average of four to five warheads. That's 90 independently targetable warhead per boat. At any given time, 12 of the 14 Ohio-class nuclear subs are actively deployed and spread around the ocean bottoms of the planet with a firing range of 4,000 miles. So at the point of attack, that's 1,080 deep sea nuclear warheads to identify, locate, and neutralize before any would-be blackmailer even get started. Indeed, with respect to the where's Waldo aspect of it, the sea-based nuclear force alone is a powerful guarantor of America's homeland security. And then there's the roughly 300 nukes aboard the 66 strategic bombers, which are also not sitting on a single air airfield Pearl Harbor style waiting to be obliterated, but are constantly rotating uh, in the air and on the move. Likewise, 400 military, uh, Minutemen three missiles are spread out in extremely hardened silos deep underground across a broad swath of the upper Midwest, which would also need to be taken out by any would-be blackmailer. Need needless to say, there is no way, shape, or form that America's nuclear deterrent can be neutralized by a blackmailer. And the best thing is that according to the most recent CBO estimates, the nuclear triad will only cost about $75 billion per year to maintain over the next decade, including allowances for peri periodic weapons upgrades. So the heart of America's military security requires only 7% of today's massive military budget. Indeed, the key component of the nuclear deterrent, which I've just described, the sea-based ballistic missiles, is estimated to cost just $188 billion over the entire next decade, or 1.9% of the $10 trillion national defense baseline currently in the budget. By contrast, the actual cost of the national security complex is $1.3 trillion per year, as I've mentioned. It includes the $346 billion Veterans Administration budget, 
and 70 billion for international uh, operations and security assistance, along with the 900 billion defense budget proper. Yet if you allow an ample 375 billion per year for a Fortress America continental defense, as well as we will describe shortly, and 75 billion for the triad strategic deterrent that I've just described, the question recurs. Where does all the rest, 850 billion, go? Well, it goes to the war capital's pursuit of global military and political hegemony and to fund the deferred cost of, vast, of past overseas policing operations, neither of which were and are necessary for America's homeland security. And beyond that, tens of billions more slop over into the aforementioned budgetary self-promotion. Still, just consider the 346 billion, 346 billion for veterans' compensation, medical care, and other benefits. These programs serve upwards of 6.2 million disabled veterans and dependents and 9.2 million enrollees in the veterans' medical care system. Yet, absent all the unnecessary wars that have occurred since the Cold War attained full force in 1949, the U.S. would have only 60,000 veterans of foreign wars today, of which only 11,500 are currently receiving disability benefits. Even when you add in their dependents, the total of World War II era vets receiving disability compensation is just 34,000, or six-tenths of 1% of the total beneficiary role of 6.2 million, and accounts for less than 1% of this massive VA budget. That's right, the FY 2024 cost of veterans' benefits, owing to unnecessary wars, such as the 1.4 million v Vietnam vets on disability, and the 3.4 million Gulf War vets receiving disability, and VA healthcare is 345 billion per year out of the 346 billion total budget. And it needs to be noted that def these deferred cost figures for forever wars, because that's what they are, the, that 345 billion for the unnecessary wars from Korea all the way through the last forever war amounts to 116% of China, China's current total 298 billion defense budget. It amounts to 42%, 425% of India's 81 billion, 480% of Russia's 72 billion, 595% of Germany's 58 billion, and nearly 700% of South Korea's 50 billion military budget, notwithstanding its need to defend against the madman who rules across the DMZ. Yet it only gets worse from here. By the end of the 10-year budget window, the 550 billion baseline cost of veterans' benefits will amount to 55,000 times more than what a Fortress America Homeland Security would have generated in veterans' benefits over the past seven decades. Indeed, when it comes to the combined cost of disability compensation and VA medical care, the 286 million cost for the 11,000 remaining World War II vets is a rounding error compared to all the others. The Korean War, for instance, there are still 60,000, 2 billion a year. Vietnam, 1.4 million, as I mentioned, 44 billion a year. The Gulf War era, 3.4 million disabled vets, 112 billion per year. Other peacetime, 800,000 uh, vets, 21 billion total. 5.7 million vets at an average cost of 32,000 per beneficiary, 180 billion year in and year out just for that. For one of doubt, it is now universally agreed that the two Iraq wars were sheer folly in which upwards of 1.5 trillion was wasted to say nothing of hundreds of thousands of Iraqis killed or injured by these pointless invasions and occupations. Yet the compensation and medical care cost for the 3.4 million disability beneficiaries of this cohort alone currently totals 112 billion per annum, which is nearly double Russia's defense budget. As it happens, fully 41% 
of the 8.2 million Gulf War era veterans are on disability, a reminder that Washington's forever wars are no less a human meat grinder than the historic wars that have gone before and notwithstanding all the high-tech battlefield safeguards now available. In any event, given an average life expectancy of 75 years, the Gulf War uh, era vets alone will de uh, generate deferred costs in current dollars of purchasing power, FY 2024 dollars, equal to about 5.6 trillion uh, over a 50-year period. That's right, the deferred cost of just one set of pointless forever wars amounts to 155% of the entire regular military budget of Russia on an annual basis, and on a lifetime basis, it's actually equal to 17% of the entirety of the nation's current towering public debt of 34 trillion. Needless to say, Washington's green eye shades are happy to keep these staggering deferred costs out of the so-called defense budget entirely. Under proper accounting, of course, the lifetime cost of disability compensation and VA medical care would be amortized over each person year of combat deployments. That's a number, however, which the Sunday afternoon warriors of the Beltway would assiduously prefer not to know. Just consider the aforementioned Gulf War veterans who will spend an average of 50 years on the VA rolls. The lifetime cost per beneficiary would be about 1.67 million in today's dollars, which if amortized over the 6.5 years of average military service for current armed forces active duty personnel would result in an annual accounting charge of 105,000. So the true annual cost of sending one soldier into the forever wars is not the current already high figure of 136,000 that the Pentagon admits to, but it's actually nearly one quarter of a million dollars per year for every single soldier deployed. As we said, the Beltway lawyers would rather we didn't know. By way of historical example, if the American public had been told it would cost 250,000 per year to send a US serviceman into Kuwait for the purpose of defending the emir's right to drill directionally into Saddam Hussein's oil in the border straddling Rumalia field, they might not have waved so many stars and stripes in response to the CNN Gulf War extravaganza. Indeed, they might well have been happy to allow Saddam to collect the 2.6 billion he claimed the emir stole from Iraq by such means as he felt necessary. After all, this local spat between the gluttonous emir of Kuwait and the butcher of Baghdad had absolutely nothing to do with the liberty and security of the American homeland. In a word, there is something really haywire here. Official Washington is so caught up in its role as war capital of the world that it does not even notice that the deferred cost of veterans care for now long forgotten wars in Korea, Vietnam, and the Persian Gulf exceed the defense budget of every friend or foe on the entire planet by a long shot, and that less than 1% of the current massive 346 billion VA budget is attributable to surviving veterans of the last war which arguably contributed to Homeland Security in the pre-1949 era. Needless to say, the issue goes far beyond the startling dollars and cents of the matter. What is actually at issue is the entire framework of post-World War II foreign policy that generated a permanent warfare state and entailed the extension of a Washington-based empire across the length and breadth of the planet. But that shift from a peaceful republic thriving socially and economically behind the great ocean moats to an empire straddling the globe was, far, was more than the fragile machinery of our Madisonian democracy could successfully handle. Elected officialdom, officialdom was soon caught up in the excitement and intrigue of managing the empire, trotting the globe, and touring the Allies' vassals and provinces as visiting plenipotentiaries 
of the indispensable nation. So doing, they became shills for a global policeman narrative that served the interest of arms merchants and national security bureaucrats alike. All were conferred missions and budgets that would have not been remotely imaginable under the old Republican regime. That is to say, after America's bouts with war in the 19th century and even after World War I and World War II, there was a total demobilization of the war machine and its civilian apparatus. After World War I, for instance, the US military budget plunged by 92% from 9 billion in 1919 to barely 750 million in 1923. And even after World War II, defense spending dropped by 89% from 83 billion in 1945 to 9 billion by 1948. So, so we do mean demobilization. If you put these defense budgets in 2024 dollars of purchasing power, the wartime, uh, 1945 wartime peak was 1.6 trillion, which figure had collapsed to just 123 billion by 1948. That is to say, Washington was on its way to reverting to the legacy, to the legacy peaceful republic modality that had served America's homeland security well for 160 years. But unfortunately, that's all she wrote. Prodded by the Red Scare of 1948 to 1950, which was drummed up by the likes of Winston Churchill, Henry Luce, Richard Nixon, and the Wall Street cadres which had taken over the Departments of State, Defense, and the CIA, Washington was soon on its way to its incarnation as war capital of the world. The previous mobilization trend was precipitously reversed, and, its, and in its place arose a full-blown warfare state with the Marshall Plan, NATO, and the Korean, Korean War mobilization after June 1950. And in, 19, and in 2024 dollars of purchasing power again, the Korean War bloated defense budget was back up to $650 billion by 1953, representing a gain of 430% from the 1948 demobilization low. Ironically, one of the key architects of the Cold War, Dean Acheson, had only a few years earlier dismissed the 1945 truce line at the 38th parallel in Korea as a mere surveyor's line, and it actually was. There was never any homeland security point to the Korean War because neither communist China nor even Stalin's Russia had the remotest capacity to threaten America's military security. During his term, the great Dwight D. Eisenhower did succeed in lowering the real defense budget by 30% to $475 billion in today's dollars. But LG, LBJ soon had the defense budget back up to the Korean War level, owing to his forever war in Vietnam. At that point, the die was cast. The whole thrust behind Washington's crusade, crusades against purportedly falling dominoes and in support of so-called collective security institutions like NATO and CEDO and the re-extension of American power to Europe and the Far East was essentially a cover story for one, the permanent, revi permanently reviving the military industrial complex that had been abruptly shut down after 1945 and two, cranking up the political diplomatic and intelligence machinery of global hegemony that was latent in the wartime operations of the national security agencies on the Potomac. The pivot, this important pivot from republic to empire in 1949 remains evident today fully one third of a century after the Cold War ended and the Soviet Union was swept into the dustbin of history. Yet the war capital of the world still deploys 173,000 troops in 159 countries and ma maintains upwards of 750 bases in 80 countries. Indeed, in some sense, it's as if the World War II never ended. As of 2020, Washington still had large military forces in places where they had arrived 75 years earlier during the final span of World War II. That included 119 bases, nearly 34,000 troops in Germany, 44 bases, and 12,000 troops in Italy, 25 bases, 10,000 troops in the UK, 120 bases, 54,000 troops in Japan, 73 bases, 26,000 troops in South Korea. As we've indicated, the traditional post-war demobilization after 1945 would have wiped clean this slate of empire. 
But it was reversed in 1948, 1949, when the Soviet Union got the A-bomb and Mao won the civil war in China. Thereafter, the spread of bases, troops, alliances, interventions, and forever wars proceeded relentlessly on the grounds that the rickety communist states domiciled in Moscow and Beijing posed an existential threat to America's survival. They did not, not by a long shot. As the great Senator Robert Taft held at the time, the modest threat to homeland security presented by the war-ravaged corpus of the Soviet Union and the collectivist disaster imposed on China by Mao could have been readily handled with first an overwhelming strategic nuclear retaliatory force that would have deterred any possibility of nuclear attack or blackmail, and second, a Fortress America conventional defense of the uh, shorelines and airspace that would have been exceedingly easy to stand up, given that the Soviet Union had no navy worth speaking of in China, had devolved into an industrial and agricultural anarchy owing to Mao's catastrophic experiments with collectivization. That Taftian framework never did change throughout the end of the Cold War in 1991, even as the technology of nuclear and conventional warfare evolved apace. With very modest military spending, Washington could have kept its nuclear deterrent fully effective and maintained a formidable fortress defense of the homeland without any of the apparatus of empire at all. And after 1991, the requirement would have been even less demanding. The truth, of course, stands in sharp contradistinction to the hoary theory of collective security, which led to the establishment of NATO in 1949 and its regional clones thereafter. Yes, there were sizable local communist parties in Italy and France in the late 1940s, and the Labour Party in England had a reddish hue. But the, but, but the now open archives of the old Soviet Union prove conclusively that Stalin had neither the wherewithal nor the intention to invade Western Europe. What military capacity the Soviet Union did resurrect after the bloodletting with Hitler's armies was heavily defensive in character and lumbering in capabilities. So the communist threat in Europe could have been wrangled out by these nations at the poles, not on the battlefield. They did not need NATO to stop an imminent Soviet invasion. Of course, what NATO did accomplish was to reduce dramatically the burden of defense spending in Western Europe, even as most of these nations opted for an expansive and expensive welfare state. That is to say, the warfare state that America didn't need ultimately enabled the welfare states that Europe couldn't afford either then or now. Needless to say, once the Washington-based empire bases, alliances, collective security, and relentless CIA, CIA meddling in the internal affairs of foreign countries was established, it stuck like glue, even as the facts of international life proved over and again that the empire wasn't needed. That is to say, the alleged lessons <clears throat> of the interwar period and World War II were falsely played and replayed. The aberrational rise of Hitler and Stalin did not happen because the good people of England, France, and America slept through the 1920s and 1930s. Instead, these monsters uh, rose from the ashes of Woodrow Wilson's 1917 intervention in the quarrel of the old world that was none of America's business. Yet the arrival of two million uh, doughboys and massive flows of armaments and loans from Washington enabled a vindictive peace of the victors at Versailles rather than an end to a pointless world war that would have left all sides exhausted, bankrupt, and demoralized, and their respective domestic war parties subject to massive repudiation at the polls. As it happened, however, Wilson and Versailles did give birth to Hitler and Stalin, and the latter in the end did fortunately bring about the demise of the former at Stalingrad. That should have been the end of the matter in 1945, and in fact, the world was almost there. After the victory parades, demobilization and normalization of civilian life proceeded all around the planet. Alas, the incipient war party of military contractors and globetrotting operatives and officials, officialdom gestated in the heat of World War II was not about to go quietly into the good night. 
Instead, the Cold War uh, was midwifed on the banks of the Potomac when President Truman fell under the spell of war hawks like uh, Secretary James Burns, Dean Acheson, James For Bo Forrestal, and the Dulles brothers, who were loath to go back to their mundane lives as civilian bankers, politicians, or peacetime diplomats. So in the post-war world, uh, uh, in the post-war period, world communism was not really on the march, and the nations of the world were not implicated in falling dominoes or gestating incipient Hitlers and Stalins. But the new proponents of empire loudly insisted they were that, that they were just the same and that national security required the far-flung empire that is still with us. So um, we uh, could uh, add to this, and I've uh, published uh, uh, an additional uh, uh, part, which I think I've run out of time for, unfortunately, but basically says uh, that the empire can and should be dismantled, that 1949 was a crucial mistake, a pivot point that has led uh, to uh, this massive fiscal and political crisis that we have in America today. Now, this is pretty evident to a lot of us, uh, but it was evident to Mises in 1949, and I think we should have followed his advice. Thank you. Thank you.